So now I have uh, seven characters throughout Huck Hopper that we've actually, you know, started putting them to T-shirts and stickers and everything else. And so that was what the game that I had submitted to the toy box. About an hour later, they called me. They wanted me to come to Hollywood, send me a plane ticket, and then I competed on the toy box. Welcome to the Invention Stories podcast, where we share stories of inventors who turn their idea into a product. Please visit our website at www.inventionstories.com. And now, from the Invention Stories podcast World Headquarters Studios in Morro Bay, California, is our host, Robert Baer. Welcome to the Invention Stories podcast brought to you by the Socket Saver. Do the plugs fall out of your wall sockets? The Socket Saver is an easy, safe, and effective solution. No repairs necessary, no circuit breakers involved, no electrical knowledge or mechanical skills required. Socket Savers are inexpensive, efficient, and portable. For more information, please visit www.socketsaver.com. You're listening to episode 32 of the Invention Stories podcast with our guest, Jesse James Gherkin, and his invention, Huck Hopper. Now, Jesse James is an author, a product developer, comic, blues harmonica player, and a fourth generation working class union electrician. His invention, the Huck Hopper, is a tabletop party game with a focus on education, motor skills, silly challenges, and fulfilling rewards. And the best part, Jesse James created Huck Hopper with his 10 year old daughter. My name is Robert Bear, and I'm your host, and I'd like to start off by saying, how awesome I think this is. I mean, father and daughter inventing together, wonderful. To purchase or for more information, please visit www.huckhopper.com. Now we've got Jesse James on the line from West Virginia, so let's get started. Welcome, Jesse James. Now, I look at your uh, LinkedIn profile, and it says you're an author, a product developer, a comic, uh, a blues harmonica player, and a fourth-generation working-class union electrician. What out of all of that do you enjoy the most? Uh, probably the blues, man, part, honestly. I love, love doing the blues. Okay. I've traveled all over the country playing blues, and I've met a lot of famous people doing it. It's just, it's exciting. Do you go by Jesse or Jesse James, and how did you get named Jesse James? Is that a silly question? No, well, it was supposed to be Huckleberry, again, to the Huck Hopper aspect. And then uh, my mom and dad went back and forth over it, and they finally agreed if they were going to give me a cool original name, then it would end up being Jesse James. So, yeah, that's why everybody knows me as Jesse James. All right. Well, what kind of kid were you? I was what they would call the uh, rich boy. I wasn't a rich boy. I was a rich boy, meaning I had grew up with a coal stove, and I was chopping wood. And I had a dirt bike, and that was my life. I was country kid. And where did you grow up in? Uh, is it uh, was it West Virginia? Yes, Fairmont, West Virginia. Okay. And were you an inventor back then? Yes, I was. I was had been an inventor like ever since I can remember. I was tearing stuff apart. So that's kind of how your mind worked. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. And so your family, your dad, grandfather, and great-grandfather, they were all electricians, so you thought that was just sort of like in your blood? Yes, exactly. It was a, a time-honored, you know, family trade. All my uncles were electricians, and we just kind of kept it going now in fourth generation. Okay, and how was school for you? Were you a good student? Did it come easy to you? Were you bored with it? I was bored with it, yeah. So, you know, of course, I became the class clown, naturally. I had got bored, so I created things that were considered distracting to the class. <laughs> <laughs> but you did go to college, though, right? And uh... Yes. Yes, I, I went in for engineering, and then um, I, I started to get to where I was, like, uh, Figuring that the more loans I took on, that it was going to take longer to get get my loans paid off. And so I took a contract over into Bermuda and went over to Bermuda as a as electrical contractor for a while and paid off my school loans and decided that I could probably do better off in life without college. Okay. 
You know, a lot of electricians just completely bypass college. Why did you choose to go? Because I wanted to learn CAD. That was the whole point. I wanted to know CAD. That way I could do all my own CAD drawings. So I took CAD in Autodesk so I could learn how to do all my own drawings when I wanted to do prototyping and such. At least you were doing, uh, you learning something that was uh, productive for you. Well, what, what, exactly. What is Bootlegger's Production? Bootlegger's Production is my music company where we actually write jingles. And it's also where I write my albums through. Because I had uh, put out like four or five music albums that I never really marketed, but I made them in the studio. But that is what we write jingles for, for people, through Bootlegger Productions. And it's also anytime that my band, the Bootleggers, does play out, that we use the Facebook page for it as well to announce that we're going to show up and play in a town somewhere. How do you like playing in front of people? I love it. I live for being on stage. My daughter's the same way. She's 10 years old. She just she could live on stage if you let her. Do you ever get real nervous before you go on stage? Not really. I mean, nowadays it's just kind of more of a thrill. I mean, when I first started out getting in front of large crowds, doing like festivals and stuff, I used to kind of freeze up a little bit, you know, where I'd get like trip over my own guitar chords and stuff. But now I just kind of absorb it, throw my hands in the air and jump on. I read that you were a harmonica player, but you play guitar as well? Yes. Yes, I'm pretty known for being a harmonica player, a guitar player. I could hold my own. You know, I could uh, play well enough to get paid, but I'm most known for being a harmonica player. All right, very cool. So uh, what is The Slugs? The Slugs is a book that I am getting ready to release. I've been waiting for everything to calm down before I I went ahead and released it because I actually pulled a couple books out of production that were released. And uh, only because I didn't want to be known for like being a weird author, rather, because I was writing about the mafia before, and they kind of t- I've got like a, a subculture following as an author. So the Slugs was more based on like West Virginia and all the mysteries of of the unknown in West Virginia, like the uh, Green Bank Telescope and all that. When I think of West Virginia, I just think of something off the beaten path. Is that truly how how you see West Virginia? It's a little bit more country, a little bit off the beaten path. Does it have a little bit of a a throwback feel, or is it... No, it really is off the beaten path. I mean, if you want to get into West Virginia from anywhere, you have to fly into Pittsburgh. If you want to go see a professional athletic team, you have to go to Pittsburgh. So, I mean, we're just, we're our little corner of the world. But one thing to be said about West Virginia is... It would be the best places if anything ever happened in the world. You're, you're away from natural disasters. You know, uh, you're high up in elevations. So, I mean, that's, I guess, why I've always clung to it as well. It's like, it's the ultimate sanctuary. When you, anytime you need to get away from the cities and get away from people in general that, you know, because I live in the rat race. I do. I'm, I'm like sucked up to D.C. at the moment because I work at Amazon building servers. So, I drive the two hours of traffic every day to work 12, you know, and uh, when I get in West Virginia, it's just like a breath of fresh air. That sounds nice. It takes you two hours to get to Washington, D.C. from where you are? Yeah, because of traffic. I, I'm right now staying on the edge of uh, D.C. to work at Amazon through the week, and I go back to West Virginia on the weekends. Oh, okay. I, I thought it took two hours from West Virginia. My geography is not the strongest, but uh, I did think it was further than two hours. <laughs> oh, it is, yes. Yes, I have a place that I rent down here that I work through the week. And now it's time for a commercial break. The Invention Stories podcast is brought to you by The Socket Saver. I want to take this moment to thank you for listening. This is our 32nd podcast and it's truly been a blast. It's so much fun following your passion. I spent most of my life not following mine, and now I wonder why I didn't. I encourage everyone listening to follow your passion in 2018. If you've been thinking about podcasting yourself, I say go for it. And when you do, drop us a line and we'll give you a shout out on the show. You know, you don't have to have a series. You could just produce one or however many you like. All you need is a computer and you can download free Audacity software. The only thing you need to buy is the microphone. And what we use and recommend is the ATR2100 by Audio-Technica. 
I think it sounds great and it's about $70. If you would like to purchase it while supporting the Invention Stories podcast, please go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash ATR. What is Hillbilly Edison? Hillbilly Edison is a up-and-coming licensing company. Basically, we are offering licensing deals to inventors because I've partnered with one of the uh, one of the more renowned licensing gurus, and we are going to offer licensing deals on a deal where basically instead of taking twenty percent all the way through the licensing deal, then we're going to take the you know we'll offer it up so we'll just take like the best month out of your quarter and take 20 percent of that and so that's my business model so it's still sort of in the works well i mean it's it's established and we do smaller stuff but as for the licensing itself that's something that we have just now started actually offering to other people because i built it originally just for myself as a platform for marketing and then it of course, when I started gaining popularity, I went to friends and family, and then I started helping them with their patents. And then now it's got to the point where it's like I'm getting swamped with people actually wanting some assistance. So it's become more of a full-on thing. And where do people go to learn? What's the website for that? It has its own website, hillbillyedison.com. Okay. Pretty catchy name. All right. Yeah, uh, well, it's a pretty cool annotation because, you know, I'm trying to take the word hillbilly and actually put the Edison behind it. So it's no longer a derogatory thing to be a hillbilly because the truth be known, most of the inventors that throughout America all came from the Appalachia. So that's why I started the Appalachian Inventors Group. So are you the president of the group? Correct. Okay. Do you have meet like one? How does that work? You meet once a month or? Right now we're doing summertime summer camps is why we've been doing it because everybody's so busy, of course, you know. So we're doing like summertime summer camps is, and it's uh, Spark Farms is what we call it. We got a piece of property in West Virginia where we get together and we do like everything from you know, drone races and everything else. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. Well, uh, let's get to it. Uh, Jesse James, what is Huck Hopper and how did it Huck all start? Hopper. Yeah. Huck Hopper is something that my daughter invented, and she still started with a shoebox because we had Chuck E. Cheese, and then we took it home, decorated it, painted it, and it became a cool little game. She named it Huck Hopper because that was supposed to be my name growing up was Huckleberry, and that was the fun of it, was uh, the name itself because the name stuck, and then it became Huck Hopper. So now I have uh, seven characters throughout Huck Hopper that we've actually, you know, started putting them to T-shirts and stickers and everything else. And so that was what the game that I had submitted to the toy box. About an hour later, they called me. They wanted me to come to Hollywood, send me a plane ticket, and then I competed on the toy box. But the thing was is I was expecting the older judges that I seen on season one. So when I get out there, the judges were much younger than expected. So the, the questioning was, of course, over their heads. So it was still a fun experience. I do believe I would have had a better chance if I would have known that there, I was pitching to younger kids. Has your episode been shown on TV? Yes, it had just aired three weeks ago. Okay, and uh, did you get some good hits on the website for that? Yes, we did. We've had a lot of positive response. And then, um, you know, we're getting ready to come out of the licensing agreement with Mattel, meaning that I'm going to offer it to two other companies, so I'm getting ready to pitch it to Hasbro next week. So you did, you, uh, you've had a licensing agreement then, huh? Yes, there was a preemptive licensing agreement that they made me sign with Mattel that was, it held me to 30 days past the airing of my show, and uh, luckily enough, they did not produce my product, which was great, because I did really want the agreement to begin with being that the numbers were so low but i got the exposure out of it and it gave me the publicity so i'm gonna move on with that and go right on over to hasbro and compete against hasbro's current game monkey dunk which is right in line with huck hopper so we're gonna go in competition with monkey dunk now we're going to market i've already got all my numbers uh know exactly how much it costs to make it here in america and 
I'm going to take it to them and say, here you go. You're the first one in line. And what is your strategy for getting it out there? Uh, like, where do you sell it currently? Right now, I've shut it down only because I was making it out of West Virginia and my profit margins weren't so big, but I was doing it more on the long lines of just making a few bucks on it and getting it out there to do like field testing and proof of concept. I've given to a lot, a lot of teachers had it, a lot of parents, local parents had it. We got it into a couple schools. And so we did a proof of concept with it. So like the money wasn't to be made on, on smaller than 5,000 unit runs. So my choices at this point are I can either license it off to someone like Hasbro or, or Spin Master or Parker Brothers. Or I could, of course, crowdfund it with Kickstarter and take it into a crowdfunding aspect. And that way, like I said, I already have all the numbers down. I know exactly how much it costs to make the batch of them and everything. If you were to do it yourself, how, what's your strategy You know, to get it out there into the game shops and to, to make it a household game? How, what's your strategy to do that? Well, if I do take the you know do-it-myself route, which, of course, everybody's inventing knows that licensing is the way to go, it's so much easier to let somebody else worry about the product liability insurance and, you know, return policies. And if I wanted to do it myself, which really I'd rather license it, but if I did, then it would just be as simple as start the Kickstarter off. I've already written the Kickstarter. It's, it's ready to go. If I do take that decision, it's just a trigger pull away, and then it would be live on Kickstarter. And then that, would, of course, would just be a crowdfunded situation. And after I get 5,000 units promised out, pledged however you look at it then i call up massachusetts massachusetts actually starts making them they already have the molds ready to go and i ended up securing all of ouija boards google in the dark ink from their oracles so that was pretty cool they had some leftover ink and now we can make our fox glow in the dark because of that that sounds uh cool in case people want to play it in the dark <laughs> yeah uh, if the lights go out what else are you going to play with because everything else takes batteries yeah yeah seems very competitive the uh the game industry and let me ask you you have a patent on huck hopper right correct okay and how was the patent process for you well, i did it myself i mean i write ppas and uh, sell sheets myself so it was pretty much just a cakewalk it was just like doing what i do all the time did it cost what you thought or take as long as you thought it would i, I mean i already knew the expenses so you know, I was prepared for it. I already knew how to word it, so I already, you know, I, I got it right through. They already wrote a few patents already. It's just like this wasn't my first one. I have seven other patents. Seven other but patents. Me, <laughs> yeah, I was in tools was my thing way before I ended up in games, and this was just kind of like, uh, you know, more of an ode to my daughter. We had the prototype sitting there, looking at us. People were wanting it. People were wanting it, and they were like, "Okay, let's just try it." And we did. And it caught on, and they're like, okay, well, uh, we're on to something here. So, you know, of course, me, I've got to put down all of my stuff because I'm over here building motorcycle parts and different tools and such like that. Man stuff. I've never really wanted to be a, a, a toy inventor. It just it came upon me. Just the first one that hit, basically. As you've been working, what do you find is a good use of your time and money? And what do you find is like a real waste of time? A good use, I, I, I'm writing a book called An Empire from a Cardboard Box, which is basically the, the fundamental approach to inventing should be the cheapest mediums possible. If you can make it with a 3D printer yourself, if you can make it out of a cardboard box like what I had done, if you can carve it out of soap, either way you look at it, it's just so many people spend so much money thinking they need to make these perfect prototypes, these perfect working prototypes. And that's why I said pinch pennies, because... When it comes down to it, they don't want to see the utility patent and the perfect working prototypes. Yes, it's going to get your point across. But we're in this age now where, you know, we can do 3D printing. We can do 3D modeling. Anything that I wanted to show you, I can show you on a computer. It doesn't have to exactly have to be a $10,000 prototype sitting on the desk in front of you. People can get their point across with a couple hundred dollars. Some cardboard and some paint go a long way. I like that. That's a that's some good thoughts because you're right. I, I listen to a lot of people and they spend a fortune prototyping and I always wonder if they really need to spend that much money. What have you mastered, Jesse? I've mastered just that, which is simplifying the invention process. That's a good thing to master. Uh, 
I, I, I try to think. I don't think I've mastered anything, but uh, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is being able to help others from falling into the grasp of what I call the sharks, which is these predatory people that are spending millions of dollars in advertisement, taking money from what would be inventors and putting a bad taste in these people's mouths to be an inventors. Because if you have one, you have many. If you're an inventor, you're an inventor of more than one thing. And that's what gets me upset is people jump into the ring. They, they get all excited. They put their money on the line. They put their house on the line sometimes, and they get taken by these people. So my main passion, my movement is to make people aware that you can do a lot of this yourself. And if there are things that you need to pay for, there are simpler ways to go about it. I mean, really, you can pay a college kid who's going through art school if you need somebody to draw something, if you can't do it yourself. You can outsource through Craigslist. You can outsource through Fiverr. You do not need to pay the money that people pay these days. I, I hate the predatory uh, people that the ones that just they see the inventors as an easy mark. And yeah, what would blow well, your? We are though because we're passionate about our stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. I got taken in the beginnings. Everybody does. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Everybody does. Probably. I know I did. So, uh, well, what would blow yeah, your? Would... What would blow your mind? I mean, it's. What would blow my mind? Yeah. Probably this little motorcycle safety part that I'm working on right now. That I, if it takes off, if it gets picked up by one of the major manufacturers, then it's easy street. Then I, I, I get to sit back and actually diddle with everything that I've ever done, and then help other people. You know, a lot easier because I, it won't, it won't be on the sense of taking away from my time because I have more time available. Once I start getting the, the mailbox money, but that would blow my mind if I can get this motorcycle safety part to take. But right now I've got to get it through some uh, some rigors of DOT testing. It has to hit through some DOT testing, some underwriters laboratories. If I get that finished and in, then you're going to see my name up in lights. It's coming. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then here's the final one. What change would you like to see in the world? The change that I would like to see in the world is people's perspective on inventing in that aspect, that they think that it all has to be secretive, that you can't really tell nobody. I mean, all you need is a non-disclosure agreement. You can tell the key people that need to know, you know, but like I want to make it so everybody feels comfortable to come out there, much like Perky, to come out there and talk about their stuff to an extent, mind you. You know, but right now the world's getting so gun shy because of, there's so many people that are being predatory. You know, I'd like to see it where people feel comfortable about claiming to be a product developer, or an inventor, or an idealist. Because nowadays it's something that people are almost ashamed to say because they think that that just says dreamer, and that's not the case. We are, we are a real thing. Yeah, and a dreamer. I, I don't see anything wrong with being uh, accused of being a little bit of a dreamer, but yeah. Yeah, but if they're only just seeing us as dreamers, that's that's a different story. Okay, well, I want to thank you for uh, for allowing me to interview you, and it's great that you mentioned Quirky, because our next podcast episode is with the first uh, Quirky inventor since Quirky's come back, and on uh, January, oh, awesome. January 1st, we're going to be sharing our interview with Gina Waldhorn, the new president of Quirky. And so, yes, uh, I read her article. Yeah, but... Uh, Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and finish up here, and and I want to ask you, uh, if somebody came to you for advice and they got an idea for an invention, what would you tell them? I would say, let's you know, let's start small, and if it's not a winner, let's shelf it and see what else you got, because that's the hardest part in the world, right there, is is somebody telling you, I'm sorry, they already exist, or it's not going to make it. So, I mean, you know, let's keep an open mind, and if we have one, we have many more. You know, if you're an inventor, you're an inventor. That's just the way it is. It's like if you're a pitcher in Major League Baseball, if you can throw one fastball 100 miles an hour, it ain't going to be the last one you throw. You've been listening to episode 32 of the Invention Stories podcast with Jesse James Gherkin and his invention, Huck Hopper. I want to thank Jesse James for being our guest today. For more information, please visit www.huckhopper.com. The Invention Stories podcast has been sponsored by The Socket Saver. Does the plug fall out of your wall socket while vacuuming, drying your hair, using a power tool, or recharging your electronic devices? The Socket Saver is an easy, safe, and effective solution. Please visit www.socketsaver.com. 
More information and show notes can be found at our website, www.inventionstories.com. Thank you very much for listening today, and please tell a friend.